for joining us today at the Yukon Pavilion for a discussion on critical minerals and metals. As we move into 2024, it's hard not to hear the term critical minerals um, as they are now coined the building blocks for our future in the green and digital economy. My name is Jessica Kachachak, co-host of BTV Business Television on BNN and Fox Business News. Um, and I'm joined today on stage by three Yukon-based resource companies, Granite Creek Copper, Metallic Minerals, Nickel Creek Platinum, and Rock Haven Resources. Welcome, gentlemen. Um, if you don't mind, please introduce yourself and give a brief, brief description of your project in the Yukon. We'll start with you, Stuart. Oh, great. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Um, Stuart Harsha, President and CEO of uh, Nickel Creek Platinum. We're uh, a large nickel, copper, cobalt, platinum, palladium uh, project with a PFS uh, resource uh, in the southwest uh, in the Kluwani range. So it's uh, an exciting project. Stuart, and thanks, Jessica. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in and coming to see us today. My name is Matt Turner. I'm the president and CEO of Rockhaven Resources. Um, we've got the Klaza project. It's kind of in south-central Yukon, about a three-and-a-half-hour drive or so away from the capital city of Whitehorse. Um, our project hosts about 1.6 million ounces of gold equivalent, um, with about, say, 80% of the value in gold. Um, another, say, 10% in silver and 5% lead, 5% zinc. So we do have that, you know, the suite of critical metals there, the silver, lead, and zinc that's important to our project and important to the concentrates. Where our project uh, stands right now is we've completed a PEA, and now we're going into the PFS based on that, uh, that uh, highly successful PEA that we put out a couple of years ago. Awesome. Thank you. Tim? Uh, thank you, Jessica, and thank you, everybody, for tuning in and, and joining us in the room. Uh, my name is Tim Johnson, President and CEO of Granite Creek Copper. Our project is a CarMax project located in central Yukon. Uh, excellent infrastructure in our project. We're within 20 kilometers of the grid, uh, within 40 kilometers of paved highway. It is a road accessible project. Uh, we are a PEA stage project. Uh, we completed the PEA January of last year, and I've been working to improve the metallurgical recoveries on the project. And we just recently put news out uh, showing that we have the potential to increase the value of the project by over 50% uh, based on improved uh, met work. Um, yeah, great projects, copper and gold project. Uh, we're within what's known as the Minto Copper Belt. And uh, because we're uh, copper focused is why we're on the Critical Minerals Panel. And um, look forward to talking to you more about that. Thank you. Thanks, Tim, Jessica, appreciate it. My name is Scott Petzl. I'm president of Metallic Minerals Corporation. We are a junior explorer uh, located not only in the Yukon, but in Colorado. Our key assets in the Yukon are our Kino Silver Project, where we're exploring for silver lead zinc in the famous Kino Silver District. We're on the verge of announcing our initial or inaugural resource for the project in the very near term. We also have alluvial royalty portfolio with uh, some active alluvial gold uh, operations that are generating revenue for the company in the famous Klondike district of the Yukon. Amazing. Thank you all. Um, so as I mentioned, it's kind of hard to escape the term critical minerals and metals right now, and especially as we move into 2024. But can you share with the audience exactly what that means? Like what are critical metal metals? What are critical minerals? Um, why don't we start with you, Stuart? Um, so critical, and I mean, people always got kind of worried about terms like critical, right? Um, the way I define it is is there's a difficulty associated. With it. That's why it's called critical, and it's either geopolitically it's it got some issues, or it's actually scarcity in terms of its ability to uh, you know source new new different pieces of it. Really, what's been driving critical minerals has been really this EV evolution, as as, as everybody's talking about, uh, you know, getting out of uh, carbon uh, uh, fuels. This, this has really been the driver that's cr created the critical minerals. It's not um, something that's new. It's been around for many years. It's just become more politicized to be the path forward for the, for the planet. And it's literally every area has slowly got onto it to the point where we're now trying to figure out how to find the minerals in order to satisfy this goal of getting down to lower carbon, I would call it, as opposed to zero carbon. So we have copper and nickel on the panel today. Can you guys, can someone else jump in here and describe maybe why those are critical uh, metals and minerals? 
Yeah, like the term critical for me is really critical to the future of our societies and the growth of our societies. Um, I co-chair for AME Roundup this year, but also last year. Our theme last year was actually, it was critical to our future and it really resonated with, uh, with not only all the attendees, but just even with the sponsors, like Tech, Tech was our, and still is our patron sponsor, right? And um, to have that as the general theme, Again, really resonated with people, but I think it really spells to um, or speaks to you know how how important it is for all of our societies, and um, again how critical it is to uh, to at least have these in our supply chains for the future of our societies to continue to continue to grow. So, and sorry, Jessica, you did have a specific no, question. No, no, that's okay. Maybe Tim metals. can jump in here about just talk a little bit more about why copper is considered. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I I will get to that. I know you've okay. asked a question. It's a second That's one. Okay. I just want to expand on something that Stuart said about political. Yeah. And that is that just about every major jurisdiction has identified critical minerals. Um, and there's tax breaks. There's incentives for, for us as miners to go out and find those minerals to satisfy society's need for them. The U.S. has identified the list. Canada has identified the list. Europe has identified the list. And it does make our job a tiny bit easier by making uh, investment in nodes uh, much easier for, for investors to get behind. Um, but you asked about why copper and nickel, and I, I, I can address the copper part. Um, there's no way we can transition to a green economy without copper. Uh, there is really no major replacement for it. There is minor substitutions in very small instances, but um, I, I, I say we're in the electrical age now. And if you think about it, everything is being electrified whether it's our transportation, our data, all of our photographs, music, everything has an electrical component now. And if you want that electrical component to grow, you need copper. And if you want to move off fossil fuels, you need copper. And really, I think electricity and copper is one of the main drivers moving society forward today. Absolutely. Did you have anything to add, Scott? Or? Well, I'll just say that uh, following up on Tim's comment here about copper is that I have heard that essentially you're going to need double the size of the grid in North America to be able to deliver the power to support the green energy transition. That's a lot of copper when you think about the existing grid in space. But the other thing that he said that I think is important is what makes a mineral critical is there are no substitutes. And so a lot of these minerals that we're looking for are very important for the development of the green energy economy, they can't, or at least the technology hasn't become available to find an adequate substitute for them. So as we mine these things, we recognize they're scarce. This is what's caused them to be on the critical minerals list. And uh, and I think, you know, we're, we're marching down the right path here for sure. So. Did you want to add anything about nickel? Because we talked a little bit about copper there. Um, it's it's similar. I mean, nic nickel's really tied into the EV space. Is what everybody th sees it, um, for the growth. So that's the one that can grow and drive 800 to a million tons of nickel more needed. Uh, one thing that I always like to tell people is that nickel grows at 3% per year off of a, let's just say, 2.5 million base without this growth. Just replacing it requires 90,000 tons of nickel to be new nickel brought online every year just to meet the current demand of stainless steel and the other alloy business. The battery business is a game changer and that's really where the, the conversation on nickel and why it's so critical is that you're not going to be able to do all of the work we need to do in the EV world without more nickel and that's why there's such a pressure on it. So we're here in the Yukon Pavilion. You know, when people think about the Yukon, they think Gold Rush is just automatically what comes to their mind. Um, why is the Yukon such a desirable jurisdiction for critical metals and minerals? We'll start with you, Matt. Yeah, sure. Um, I think it, it comes down to mineral, a metal endowment in the Yukon. It's, uh, you look at Howard's Pass, um, Mac Pass with fireweed zinc, the amount of zinc that's in between those two areas. Um, casino for uh, the copper and gold endowment there. Um, Kino for uh, for the silver. Um, I don't know. Yukon seems to uh, nickel as well, right? Uh, Yukon uh, seems to cover all the bases with an incredible endowment. Um, so it's a pretty special place, I think, in the world. And again, with governments waking up to how important this is. Um, 
and also local governments too, right? And local First Nations waking up to how important this is and the, um, and the tremendous, again, getting back to the, uh, the endowment that they have in their backyards of these metals. It's, uh, I think it it's puts Yukon in such a special place globally. Does anyone have anything to add to that? Uh, I think possibly because of the, the interest previously in gold sure. has actually created the opportunity because base metals hadn't been looked at. Sure. Gold's easy, it's shiny, it's easy to raise money, it's easy to explore for. And now that you know the gold systems are well known to a certain degree in the Yukon, now we're starting to look at some of these other things. They've always been there. Geologically, things don't move that fast. But in order, you know, where we are in the development has, has made phenomenal opportunity in Yukon in that, in that endowment, that geological endowment has always been there and we're just starting to recognize it. Very good. You, sorry, Scott. I, I would add yeah. just in terms of jurisdiction, you know, and Yukon being a great place to work. We all, we all say it. And it might be unpopular in a resource investment conference to say, well, it's difficult, it's challenging in the Yukon because there's a lot of change going on right now with respect to sure. land use planning and engagement strategies and how the indigenous communities are included in this conversation, changes to the Canadian mining law, all those things. But one thing that I would say about that that makes the Yukon a good place to work is those issues are actively being addressed. And we support that change because that change is going to create certainty in terms of when we step in and do a project, whether it's critical minerals or not, it's going to supply us with that certainty that there is a chance that this project can get development, developed if it meets all the economic criteria to do so at a, at a future time. So in a sense, the Yukon's being very uh, progressive in addressing these indigenous uh, engagement issues and all their regulatory framework, even though it's challenging for us now as explorers to have that certainty, but the certainty will come. And, uh, and I think that's a really good, good thing for the Yukon. As opposed to uh, where you see resource nationalism in, uh, in foreign countries that, uh, you know, it becomes very challenging to, to have that certainty. That's a really good point. Did you have anything to add to that? Stuart, I mean, we, we, we talked a lot about it. I mean, yeah. the, the one thing I would say is this event today is an example of the commitment of the Yukon. And yeah. having, having Premier Ranch here, having, having Minister Strickland here, having a lot of the different people, it shows the commitment that the Yukon has to the development of its resources. And we will work together. Everybody here at the table will is, is a testament to we work together and, and we can, uh, it's a great place to get achieve that goal of having a sustainable development. This isn't about trying to take advantage of a current uh, situation. It's about having something that's sustainable for the future. And that's why critical minerals play such a good part into that. It's not just taking advantage of an opportunity. It's long-term thinking by the government for the people in the Yukon and for the people in Canada. Um, speaking of sustainability, actually, so um, the argument that I've heard is, sure, we need critical minerals and metals for um, our green economy, but are these being mined sustainably, right? And so what are some of your um, practices, Tim, that you guys, uh, you know, are for like, like an ESG initiative that you might have moving forward to kind of help those processes? No, oh, it's a very good question. Um, uh, as Scott alluded to, there is a, there's a transition happening in the Yukon now where especially Indigenous communities are, um, are standing up. Uh, you know, for their rights, and and we uh, we applaud that, we recognize that, but it it's it's um, it's a new world to try to figure out, uh, you know, how to operate. Um, we've we've tried to be open with our project with with the local Little Salmon First Nations community. We had a bit of a challenge during COVID. Um, there was a couple years there where we were told, "Do not come to our communities." So it's very difficult to build those relationships that we recognize that you need to build. You need to go and spend time in the community to really understand where the community is coming from and what the community's goals uh, are and to ensure that your view of the project aligns, right? And, and you know, uh, right down to, um, not down to, but uh, in incorporating Indigenous knowledge in into your project so that <laughs> you're, you're aligned and you understand um, um, how to move forward. So it's, it's, uh, it's something that we're working on. Um, I won't say that we've hit the ball out of the park yet, and it is a work in progress, but it's always going to be, right? 
Yes, go ahead. I would just say adding to that, you know, what defines a sustainable mineral exploration or development project is the idea of creating an economy from the activities that you're doing that don't affect those future generations and their ability to also create an economy. So how do you how do you do that? And I think a key thing is engagement, as Tim mentioned, but also taking advantage of technology to minimize your footprint as you're doing the work that you're doing, or using best practices in the sense of um, always making sure that you're minimizing that impact and communicating, understanding the indigenous knowledge as Tim mentioned and, and utilizing that into your process. So, so what are some examples of technology that you might speak of to, to help with that? Well, a simple one might be, and, and unfortunately it drives cost up, but using a helicopter to access your drills instead of building a new road to that drill site. So there's a balance there, you know, but you, you're always evaluating that uh, process and practice. But the other part is progressive reclamation. If you do disturbance, coming back, uh, reclaiming that at the end of that season or at the end of that drill hole so that you're minimizing that impact as you're going forward. Sure. Yeah, if I can add yeah. to um, on Scott's last point, <clears throat> you can go back to these say in, in some cases for us, re reclaim drill pads. And within a couple of years, you can almost not even tell that they were drill pads, right? They're growing back so so fast. And uh, on Tim's point too, so we're, the, the Clasa project is within the traditional territory of of the same First Nation group as Granite Creek has uh, Little Salmon Carmack's First Nation. And we've been working on our project now for about 14 years. So we've had quite a bit longer time to, um, I guess, um, um, you know, come into the community and meet everyone and, and work with the chief and council, uh, which we really started on day one before we even started out on site in 2010. Uh, it took about five years, but then we got an exploration benefits agreement signed and uh, that was in 2015, and we've been working with them now every step of the way. And so much so, which is really neat um, for this next phase that we plan to be going into in the PFS, they've actually got an in-house mining team that they're going to be working with us to design the, the, the future mine at Clasa, uh, design it how they want to see it and how, you know, of course, the economics have to work, of course, right, for it to, to move forward. But it's, I think it's a really shining example of what can be done uh, again, you know, starting off the right foot day one, and uh, but again, it takes time, Tim. Right, but you're doing the right thing, and um, but it just goes to show where it can lead to, right? So we're really, uh, it's one of the the biggest things that our project really has going for it, with respect to a lot of others out there in uh, in in the world, right? You've got uh, your local First Nations, you know, want to see this project happen and uh, want to be involved with with the design of it. So that's great, Stuart. You have something to add there? Um, I, I would just, well, f for our project, we're lucky enough to have what's called ca carbon sequestration. So we naturally absorb carbon. So, um, Can you explain a little bit more yeah, about what that is? Yeah, so so they're essentially different minerals uh, have properties that actually take carbon dioxide out. So brucite is a mineral that we have within our, our project. So as part of our tailings, um, it will actually absorb carbon dioxide. Now you can do it naturally, which did, and it has its own process, or you can do it through a process process of forced, uh, you know, pushing uh, either an exhaust from a, an energy plant or carbon dioxide uh, directly through it. And what that is, is it's recapturing carbon into a permanent mineralization. So that actually will net net mean that you have a very low carbon footprint product. So our nickel will be very low on a carbon footprint, which is going to be very important to the to the EV market where, you know, the, the automotive companies are wanting to trace things back to source now, right? It's no longer, can you just say, a, you know, an atom of nickel or an atom of copper is an atom, you know, it's, they want to understand where it comes from and what does it carry with it. So that's one side of ESG. Um, the other piece for, for ESG for me is is really the size and, and the, the view on a project. Instead of going high grade with a short life that has the best bang for the buck, um, you go for longer, bigger projects. It, it means you're, you actually have lower uh, IRRs, right? That's the challenge that you have, is that when you go long, you don't get credit for those, you know, post 20 years, right? So our evaluations of projects as a, as a society needs to adjust to take into account the longevity of projects. 
because you don't give the benefit to the, like our project will be 20 plus years, uh, could be 30 plus years, obviously, you know, with future, that is something where you invest in the infrastructure and you get a lot of time out of that infrastructure versus a five-year project, for instance, or a seven-year that has a 40% IRR. And that's the kind of side of ESG that more conversations need to have. It is a bit of a challenge between the the capital side and the investor side as and 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 the community side and it's got to be something that's recognized going forward very good thanks guys did you have something to add to yeah i just <laughs> add about um, another way that technology can be used to reduce impact and it, it surrounds ai so right. all of our projects uh, have a long history even before we got them and what happens over time is you get incredible amounts of data and a new company gets a project and sometimes they go back and they're doing the same things over and over again. They're doing, you know, offset drill holes or doing, um, you know, the same sort of sampling. But if you're doing desktop work where you're using artificial intelligence to bring all that data in and find the patterns, you actually reduce your impact on the ground because your, your targeting becomes more exact so that when you do drill a hole, you've got a higher chance of, of intercepting something. So there's all these new technologies out there and um, you know we're, we all look to them to find ways for, for a higher success rate, but if you have a higher success rate at the end of drill bet, that means less impact because you're drilling fewer holes. We're seeing a, uh, a push towards securing a domestic supply chain of critical metals and minerals. What are you seeing in terms of government support? I'll start with you, Scott. Well, I should uh, provide a disclaimer. I'm an American by oh. citizenship. Yeah. And so uh, one of the things, you know, we as metallic minerals, we also have a project in the U.S. So I'm going to start there is that yeah. we have seen in the U.S. with uh, the Biden administration and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, a massive amount of money put into the identification of critical minerals across the country. And they've employed that money through the United States Geological Survey, who's been partnering with state geological surveys. And on our project in Colorado, we've actually seen the benefit of that where uh, the USGS and the Colorado Geological Survey have come together and done mapping specifically for critical minerals in the district in which our project resides and they've completed geophysics. So it's essentially over two and a half million dollars that the government has put into identifying critical minerals right on top of our project in Colorado. So that sh demonstrates the importance at least to the states that they're really intent on understanding where these deposits are so they can overcome these supply chain issues and shortages on these metals and future pandemics and all that sort of stuff. In Canada, uh, I'm not exactly sure what the name of the act is. I think it's the Canadian Critical Minerals Infrastructure Investment Act or something like that. And there's over a billion and a half dollars that have been earmarked to be spent towards the development of infrastructure relative to critical minerals over the next seven years. And it's in the kind of the proposal stage where you can get proposals in, and, uh, and get money back. Um, and I, I think that just, again, demonstrates that both of these jurisdictions, Canada and the US, really take this seriously, and the money is there, and the money is gonna help us do the work that we need to do in different ways, in partly um, you know, new resource roads that will be critical to the economic development of some of these deposits. Um, that's, that was Ex a great answer. Extension <laughs> yeah. of grid, et cetera, yes. Oh, awesome. Did it, Stuart, did you want to jump in or Matt, anyone? <laughs> it's all, it's, okay, so the, the governments have, have really taken, taken this serious. You've heard about the different uh, uh, visits to different countries uh, where, you know, Japan, London, France, Germany, um, where individual, not only at the federal but at a provincial level, they're, they're looking to work with their other uh, compatriots. And that's a sign of the seriousness that the governments are taking it, right? I mean, it's a, it's an, a good indication 
education. The challenge you always have is that a one and a half billion dollars sounds like a lot of money, but when you actually look at infrastructure spends, like it's not a lot of money. To, it's it's great to help, but it's not a lot of money with when you look at the cost of roads going through or cost of you know different power, the cost of you know we can go through. It's not going to solve the problem, but it shows an indication of interest and support, which is key. Yeah, the only thing that I can add to that is the uh, the recent example of the the recently completed bypass road around the village of Carmax, which is going to help us uh, both Clasa and Granite Creek and uh, Northern Free Gold, or I guess Triumph Gold now, and uh, ultimately Casino as the road gets pushed out to the casino deposit. So um, it's kind of nice to be able to point to a recent example of recently completed uh, road upgrade, actually it was not even an upgrade, they pushed in a whole new road with a new bridge and everything. So it uh, goes to show when some dollars get put behind, you know, these, these, bigger, uh, these bigger dreams for, to, to, to move these projects forward. So, and it's what, it's what projects need, especially in, in the Yukon, so. Yeah, you know, um, you know, I can add a couple of things. I think a lot of this, the, uh, the supply chain issues that we're seeing now has come out of COVID, um, where we realize that we can't rely on a single jurisdiction, whether it's China or other places in the world, to supply some of the things that have been supplied. So we're seeing a lot of onshoring, right, where we're seeing um, countries and companies going, well, you know, if there's another like event, uh, we need to ensure that we have our own resources. We see it with the car manufacturers who are making uh, direct investments into, into the battery metals companies, whether it's lithium or, or nickel, right? They're not relying on, on suppliers where they don't know if they're gonna be able to get those resources or not. And I don't think, I think we're early days in that. So I think one of the things we are missing in Canada and sent to some degree in the US is that we are ramping up uh, exploration and, and mining, but we're not necessarily ramping up the finished product. Like we're, we're not seeing um, smelters or, or hydromet facilities being proposed or being built. We're still um, envisioning shipping our concentrates overseas for, for, for final um, finishing in a lot of cases. Um, so that's probably the next phase uh, that we're going to see um, proposals to uh, uh, to produce final product. Like I think in the U.S., they're starting to look at that, um, and I, I haven't heard much about that happening in Canada or even in the Yukon. I know there's companies, you know, sort of at a, at a thought leader um, type discussion about well, why can't we produce a final product of copper, of nickel, or whatever in the Yukon? Uh, why do we have to uh, ship our concentrates overseas? Um, so I think that's a question that that that's still going to need to be uh, to be addressed. No, absolutely. That was really well answered. Did anyone else have anything to add there? No? Okay. Um, let's move on then to what do you see as a major catalyst in critical minerals favor for 2024? I'll start with you, Stuart. <laughs> A catalyst for critical minerals. I think there's a catalyst for for all of a mining industry is is really a, 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 um, you know we've went through a challenging year globally. Uh, there's been lots of different uh, geopolitical issues, if you will. Uh, there's been a lot of pressure on demand uh, across the uh, commodities. Um, so what we're really looking from critical minerals, uh, you know, is is really a rebound year, and so it's really on the looking at the you know the world is going to have to you know come back to the grips of we don't have enough of these commodities, and they're going to have to you know start seeing that being reflected in not just the commodity price, which is, you know, the, the, the holy grail of, if you will, investment. Um, it's much more just uh, the thought processes that need to go into it from all levels of government, all levels of industry, and really see the investors come back into believing in the long-term view of, uh, of the critical minerals, because I think, I think there is a bit of a hiatus there for a bit. Matt, do you have something to add there? I just I echo Stuart's comments yeah. on all fronts. Um, supply, demand, also I think as the world uh, kind of wakes up that even discoveries made today, they can take a long time to put into development, right? And again, as the world wakes up to that, when you start looking in the um, in the the pantries of these mining companies and what you know what they have. Uh, for their future, they're getting a little bit thin. So it's uh, it's going to be really important for us to uh, get the exploration 
you know, ramped up and uh, doing all the right steps on the way to development, uh, as we've talked about, to get these things going, you know, as soon as we can. I'll go first. You can go second. Okay. Um, our, our industry is really poor at, at one aspect. I mean, we're very good at finding things. We're very good at developing things. We're really poor at ex explaining to the rest of the world why the world needs us. Right? <clears throat> I remember at this conference last year, a colleague of mine, we were walking out and uh, we had our badges on and some guy in the street corner stopped and said, oh, where were you guys? Oh, we were at a mining conference. And he said, oh, you mean crypto? Oh. And, and you were like, no. <laughs> like, and just the disconnect about the, the things that we need and we're the only, we're really the only source for them, right? Um, I think that is, that, that's one of the challenge. Um, there's another point I was going to make about that, but I've lost it, so I'll hand it over to Scott. No, that was good. I had I don't have my phone here, but I had someone pick that up at an interview one time. They're like, this, this is why we need mining, right? Because everything that's in this phone, you know, is in Canada's north. So, yeah. There's, yeah. there's two sources of everything. You grow it or you mine it, right? And you know. uh, The question was... Well, the question uh, was, I forgot. It's been a while. <laughs> what are some catalysts working in your favor yeah. <laughs> for uh, critical minerals in 2024? So it's tightening supply is one. Yeah. Uh, the return of the retail investor is two. Yep. You have to expect that there are going to be continued technological advancements that may increase the requirement for these elements that will continue to drive it. The interest of the governments is really just at the nascent stage. And so you're starting to see this money and capital being deployed into this. We know, as Matt said, there's a long timeline for development on these things, and it, it's it's going to have to ramp up. And I think that education piece will be critical, but I, I think there are a lot of things. And then the continued geopolitical issues uh, around the globe are going to continue to press governments to say, we're in deep doo-doo if we don't identify where we can find this mineral and secure it for ourselves domestically. Um, thank you. You've kind of touched on it already, um, but what are some roadblocks that might be in the way um, that you face, like particularly with your actual companies, and what are some steps that you're taking to overcome those roadblocks um, to move forward? We're going to start with you, Matt. Yeah, I'd say uh, infrastructure is one of the big things. Yeah. So uh, both with access, ac access, we're really fortunate we do have a road to our site, which is huge for us. It was actually one of the reasons why we picked up the property in the first place in 2010, because it had a road. Um, but yeah, besides that, the next big thing is going to be power. And that's a huge thing for all of these deposits for, for production. So I know there's lots of, uh, there's a big move up front to evaluate different ideas for, for bringing in power to the Yukon. Uh, one of the big ones that they're looking at is tying into the Northwest Transi Transmission Line in BC. Uh, which is going to be, um, I think, really key for us. Again, there's there's a move front. Um, I know governments are looking into that right now. So <laughs> it's going to be really interesting to see how that goes. But we're going to need the power for, you know, for a lot of deposits, but namely, you know, kiss the, the big one, casino, right? Yeah, so. exactly. Tim? Well, no, same. My infrastructure, of course, is one of the big ones uh, for us. I mean, again, we do have a road access project and drive it into the middle of it. You know, in, in, in presentations, I tell people we're within 20 kilometers of the grid. Um, I should start mentioning to them that that grid is really uh, shy on capacity for, for a project or any, any of our projects. Uh, but, uh, like you said, there, there is discussions to, to connect that to the BC grid, although the news I heard recently about BC buying uh, electricity from Alberta, um, I think generation is going to come forefront. Uh, for collectively a, a lot of projects. So you, you could connect to the grid, but the grid doesn't have capacity. Um, you know, and you can even look at local generation, whether it's, um, you know, I know it's, it's not a great topic, but people have been starting to mention is the micro uh, nuclear, um, you know, which would, which would drive a project the size of, of, of any of ours and then actually provide back to the grid. I mean, there's, there's geothermal concepts out there. Um, yeah, so infrastructure is top, and really, I think for all of us, um, we do need the markets to again recognize the value that we're creating and the potential, and to come back um, because you know uh, funding these projects on our own personal credit cards is can only last for so long, right? So um, infrastructure, markets, and you know just the company's ability to to uh, engage with local communities and be able to build that consensus and build that. 
because um, there's a capacity issue there as well, right? We can we can have all our capacity, um, but if the the, uh, the groups that we're trying to engage with doesn't have capacity, then um, you, you you struggle in that as well. Thank you, Scott. Do you have something to add there? No, uh, I think <laughs> access to capital. Yeah. You know, we have great properties, all all of us here, and uh, we just we just need the money to get out and do the things that we need to do, which include the ESG side of things, but also put money into the ground and do the exploration to build resources and advance these projects. And that's a roadblock uh, among you know many others. It's a it's a challenging industry, but we're here. We're enjoying it. We're doing it. And we love it, so we'll keep doing it. <laughs> um, Stuart, did you have something to add there? I think we, I think we, we pretty much really nailed on that. it. Okay. Um, well, I want to get to some questions from the audience, um, but if we want to kind of go through now, maybe just you know share a message with investors that are watching. Um, what is something you know key and important about your projects that they should know moving forward for 2024 um, and kind of that benefit to, you know, ex exploration that you've got. So um, we'll start with you. Um, well, for Nickel Creek Platinum, this, uh, we've, you know, completed our PFS last year. Really, this is the year that we're going to try to set ourselves up to get ready to do the feasibility study. So for us, this is uh, is that uh, that first year after having had a major report, which is always a big challenge for the junior space because once the big news is out, then everybody's okay. What's next, right? So now the you know the hard work to get into the feasibility. So that's really our our focus now is to to get ready for it. For Rockhaven, uh, at our Clasa project, we're doing an updated resource estimate right now. Uh, coupled that with the pre-feasibility level MET test work. Um, the idea after all that is out, then we're going to be evaluating the next steps into PFS. So it should be a pretty exciting 2024. Uh, for our CarMax project, uh, we just actually put news out last week, uh, again on metallurgical work, that shows the potential to increase the value of our project by over 50%. Um, and there's a little situation happening in our jurisdiction where, where we're working. Um, if those of you who have been following the news, you recognize the, the Minto or the mine that shall no longer be named situation. Um, we hope that there's a, there's resolution. Uh, that asset is too good to be, uh, to be left in the state that it is. And the resolution of that, of course, will have a direct effect on us because it brings more eyes to the district and um, a really high-grade copper district with, with a lot of potential. So, there we go. Thank you. The Metallic Minerals is about to announce an inaugural resource for our Kino Silver project. It'll represent several years' worth of production through the neighboring mill that is run by Hecla, the third largest primary silver producer in the world and is our Brownfields neighbor. The other thing is we're continuing to work with Parker Schnabel of Gold Rush TV. He's leasing ground from us and producing gold, and we're receiving royalty from that operation. We're continuing to look for additional operators because it's a very scalable operation for us, which would increase the revenue to help offset or pay for back office costs, but also supplement our exploration activities. So we're excited about the future. Great project in Colorado too. Stop by the booth and say hi when you get a chance. Is there anything else you guys want to add before we wrap up here? Well, just to thank you very much for hosting this. It's, oh, it's been a pleasure. I yeah. couldn't think of anybody else to ask questions of me. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks so much. And um, everyone has booths very close here, so you can pop over and ask any questions that you like as well right in person. Um, but thanks again so much for joining us. And thank you to Invest Yukon for um, putting this panel together. And enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>